Hi there everybody, Peter of England here bringing you part two of the video entitled The Trap. Now as I uh, pre-warned this is going to be a bit of a bombshell and so what I would do uh, if I were you, uh, I know this is recorded but I would advise you to go and get a pen and a piece of paper or a small notebook and uh, that would help you to jot down pertinent facts as we go along uh, over the next which I think this is going to be a rather long one, probably 45 minutes, it could run as far as an hour. Um, so throughout this, um, this the, the video, I would like uh, you to jot down various things that I refer to and go and do some research yourself, because this is all fundamentally about educating yourself to know the deception and the fraud and the criminal behavior that is behind the entire global monetary system which funds the government and the governmental ministers that you think are looking after your best interests. So, that having been said, this is where we, we left off last time. Uh, for those of you who are hard of hearing, I've made it uh, quite large writing. So, we're going to carry on from, from that point uh, right the way through now to, uh, shall we say, what we would refer to as modern times. Now what we must remember is that from around about 1760 or 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was made, it was only around about 160 years until the Federal Bank Corporation, which was originally the Bank of America Corporation, um, that was granted its first charter. Um, it was only 160 years until those people who were behind that banking organization had taken complete control of the United States lock, stock and barrel. Now I know we're referring to the United States here, but please bear with me, it doesn't matter whether you're in Canada or Australia, whether you're in Indonesia, Singapore, Spain, Portugal or South America, what I'm saying here applies to you because this is a blanket coverage now of monetary financial control that was deliberately perpetrated and set up by these, uh, let's describe it as a global Zionist banking cartel. Right. Now, what we must remember is that using the model of the United States, um, the life generally for the people, let's say in the 1760s, who basically escaped from Europe, they escaped from oppression, and they wanted to create a new life in the, the, the colonies. They were existing in a fairly um, Garden of Eden paradise. Uh, there were many regulations, there were no rules, there was no taxation, money could be uh, exchanged in the form of gold and silver, which they dug out of the ground. So everyone was quite happy and quite quite content to live as they were. However, the, the, the monarchies and the banking elites out of Europe could see that this prize was worth having, and so they deliberately set about a plan to make sure that they had it. And how they needed to have it was how they'd always had it from time immemorial, and that is by um, controlling the money supply, which in effect, if you held or controlled the money supply, that means you were the one who was paying the piper, and so you decided the tune. It was simple. So it only took 160 years. So if we begin from 1913 was the Federal Reserve Act brought into being. Uh, why it's important and why everybody watching this video um, must begin to understand the fact that there were no coincidences in what was going on here. Why it was important that in uh, 1913, Christmas Eve, when there wasn't a sufficient quorum in the Senate, that the Federal Reserve Act was passed, 
was that they knew, i.e. the Federal Reserve Board, knew something was probably about to happen, which was the involvement of um, all countries of the world into a world war. And this was commenced supposedly by the, the assassination of what's called Archduke Ferdinand, which promoted the, the war in Europe, which then turned into a, a first world war. So, as we can see, World War I, 1914 to 18, was something that wasn't, uh, wasn't an accident. Now, if you could just run with that for a moment, and for those people who think, oh, well, no, it's just people suddenly decide they want to take up arms and run off 2,000 miles uh, across the globe to pick a fight with somebody, don't forget, it takes funding, it takes coordination, and it takes some type of determination, which most people haven't got. Most people are too lazy to go across the road and complain about the noise from their neighbor, let alone take up weapons and start fighting and killing um, for four, five, six year periods. So this World War I was in effect the setup. And from what I showed you last time on part one of the video called The Trap, you can see that from the founding of the United States, and this history is prevalent right the way throughout Europe and South America, you had a continuation of war, moments of peace, war, conflict, war, panic, financial problems, more war. So it's a continuous action that is being used. Um, and this is really why stocks and stock charts don't go in a straight line up and they don't go in a straight line. It's called rowing, yeah? Like rowing in a boat. They take it one way, they make money on the way up, and then they bet on a short spread on the way down and they make money on the way down and up and so on and so forth. So what we've got to see here is that there were certain people that were opposed to the Federal Reserve Act that were gotten out of the way on the sinking of the Titanic. One of the things we referred to last time was a, a most incredible potential for free energy through Nikola Tesla's work to be given to the world. But with the fatalities that occurred uh, on the Titanic, Tesla's funding went out the window. Um, even his accommodation at the Astoria Hotel in New York I think is where he ended up passing his last days. Um, he was bankrupt, he had no money, and so a, a light was put out there in the world. So we come to 1914, 1918, when we have quite an amazing scenario that we have a war here worldwide. What comes then is, no, no sooner is the war finished than we've got in the United States, and we had it worldwide, something called, that's an O, Roaring Twenties in the USA. So no sooner was the war finished than what happens is that the bankers start pumping money, virtual free money, into the United States. Free money so people could do whatever they wanted. And you've only got to see, uh, um, Hollywood films depicting the Roaring Twenties, uh, doing the Charleston and the Speakeasy and the illicit liquor runs, um, and you get a feeling of what that was like. So this was run, in effect, let's say from about 1920 up till around 1929, okay? So in effect, what was happening here is that the basement was being prepped with kerosene, yeah? The money was being loaded into society to make it easy for everyone to do what they did. And that was every man and his dog was investing in Wall Street, okay? They were putting their money in with the view of getting a massive return. And over this period, when it was complete, what we had then is a massive tightening. They tightened everything up, and so what happened is we had all the loans were called in. People had no money. 
and we went into the preparation now for declaring bankruptcy in the United States. So most people say by 1930, 31, I'll change the color of the pen here. So 1931, the Great Depression. Nothing great about it. 33% um, uh, unemployment. Um, around this time, there was a declaration of emergency. They declared bankruptcy, and that led to 1933. Roosevelt's Gold Confiscation Act. So with that, what we had is the gold was confiscated because the Federal Reserve, which is a what's called a joint stock trust, yeah, it's not a, a corporation or a private bank as such. Um, it's what's called a joint stock trust, and I would advise you to look up. That means it's not actually subject to regulations, and it's not required to make any reporting. That's why it's never been audited, and why, in effect, the United States Treasury has nothing to do with it. So, 1933, the Gold Confiscation Act made it unlawful for gold and silver to be used yeah, um, by by the citizens of the United States. So it was all collected in and around about 59 cents on the dollar was given for that gold and fractional reserve notes were then issued in turn. So prior to 1933, a promissory note before then was a liability and after 1933, it's supposed to have been an asset. Because that is something now that started to circulate and started to flood the, mar the market with, with fractional reserve notes, which are in effect nothing more than what's called minus money. They're not backed by anything. And it says, uh, I promise to pay the bearer on demand $5. But that means you're just going to get another $5 note for the $5 note. Prior to 1933, the promissory notes would say something like, I promise to pay the bearer on demand $5 in, in gold, gold or silver. So what we had then is what's called HRJ192. I think it was House Joint Resolution 192. And that was the official bankruptcy of the United States. The United States Treasury, Congress and Senate of the United States are all imply, implicitly involved in this. So there isn't anything that they, they weren't aware of. They knew, in fact, that the coffers were empty and now they were just handing over total control because the Federal Reserve had foreclosed on the United States Treasury and therefore demanded all the money that the, the United States Treasury had. And so that was taken. What happened then is that, in effect, you were deemed to be pledged collateral for that debt, for that future debt, because it had to be paid off. So in effect, what was happening is you were, were in effect, put into receivership and you were bankrupt. So all that, those fractional reserve notes now came in to circulation. They come into circulation. And what we have now is a foreign entity masquerading as a government treasury agency. So this was all kept from the people because they didn't want to maybe cause what's called alarm and despondency and make it known to the, the, whole, the whole of the country of what had happened or the maneuvers that had been happened. So what we end up with now is with this bankruptcy in 1933, though you may not realize it, the Constitution went, lawful money went, and the common law went out of the window. Because the common law went out of the window because there was no proper contractual law, because there was no lawful money to pay for the contracts. They were all substituted for promissory notes. The Constitution had gone out of the window 
because what had happened is Admiralty law had taken over because when a sovereign organization takes control of a debtor nation, then we end up in um, Admiralty maritime and in effect the, the receivers become uh, in effect maritime underwriters and are in effect seizing the property uh, on, board, on board the ship. So the law of debtor and creditor here sort of goes out of the window because we now have a situation where everything is functioning on trusts, okay? So what we've got now is something that was perpetrated here uh, Roosevelt's Gold, Gold Confis Confiscation Act in 33, and what we're coming up to is a period 11 years on where exactly the same thing happens again in 1944. But before I come to that, which was called Bretton Woods, what, before I come to that, what I'd like to do is to put this it was, so in effect, what I'm putting forward here is the fact that Bretton Woods was a prearranged deal, which was being set up prior to the end of the war. And it was a, Bretton Woods was in effect a, a confidence trick, a con job. It was a meeting of the mafia. It was a meeting of the heads of these mafia departments that were trying to decide how to cut up the world for their own good. But one thing you should really be in, in bear in mind is uh, who was paying for everything that was coming out of the, the Second World War? Who was funding it? So don't forget, the United Kingdom had gone on to what's called the Gold Standard Amendment Act in 1931 because it was virtually bankrupt. The United States, since 1933, had been bankrupt. Germany was actually bankrupt following the f end of the First World War uh, in, in something called uh, the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, which is the, the globalist deal for reparations. France was broke. So you've got to ask yourself, coming up to the Second World War, who actually funded Germany? Who funded Hitler and the Nazis to, br to build up their armaments? Um, where did the United States get its money from? to then do a, what's called a cash and carry only uh, agreement to provide um, uh, armaments and uh, uh, fuel, etc., for the British. It was bankrupt. So someone, somewhere, must be funding this operation. And if it isn't the Americans because they were bankrupt, if it isn't the Brits because they were bankrupt, and if it isn't Germany being able to rearm itself or the French, where was the money coming from? And it's quite obvious that it was coming from an international banking cartel that had an agenda. It was playing the piano and it had foreknowledge of everything that was going to happen. Otherwise, it couldn't happen because these things can't happen without money. And so on and on we drifted. And so we're coming up to this, this quite important point now uh, where we come into... Uh, the architects of, of Bretton Woods. Now, for one, many people think or are told that Henry Dexter White from the U.S. Treasury, U.S. Treasury Secretary was a guy called Henry Morgenthau. We've got Henry Dexter White advising the United States Treasury. But don't forget, they're bankrupt. And we've got what's called, I think it's John Maynard Keynes. Can I get it on? Yeah, so we've got Keynes, right? Now, these are supposed to be the two architects, the economists with the best brains in the world who had come together to put Bretton Woods together. Yeah? Now, what happens if I was to say to you, well, it wasn't Henry Dexter White. 
It was a Lithuanian Jew, and his name was Henry Weissnowitz, okay, um, who was the first director of the IMF. And so this chap here was anything but a, uh, a, an American. He was a communist. He'd been accused of communism. He'd been uh, also noted quite, uh, quite often in uh, um, special notes and file references by J. Edgar Hoover as being suspic uh, under suspicion of spying. Um, and he was the one who said uh, that Russian communism was a system that was seemingly uh, working and an example because it, its action showed that it worked. So what we have is another individual whose rules and whose uh, advices were the main part of Bretton Woods in place, which trumped a lot of the arguments by Maynard Keynes, who was a, a, was a British economist. And so what we had is we had the, the war coming to a conclusion and two sets of documents were formulated here. There was the official documents for the press and everybody else to read, but there were the other documents behind. It's a bit like what happens in the World Economic Forum when there's a press team allowed in, then they're talking about puppy dogs and snowflakes and puffy clouds and all the nice little things and cupcakes and muffins. And then when the press leave the room, they get down to the, the real business, yeah? And that's how to globalize and get as much toxic material into you one way or the other. So this is what we, we had. So what we got, what we had here is we had 44, 44 nations, which were the allies. And these allies became UN, because they were united, the United Nations, and the UN formed immediately the IMF, and this guy here was the first chairman of the IR IMF, and the World Bank started at the very time, the same time. So what we had here in Bretton Woods, it was like it was like three or four foxes sitting down at the table with the chicken, and the discussion is what's for dinner. Yeah, they knew very well what was for dinner because now the main contention was how do we win the peace? Yeah, what they meant by how do we win the peace is how do we sufficiently bamboozle the public worldwide through the press, through the media, the publications and the official statements by government officials and ministers that everything's okay now and the promise that had been made to the 44 allied uh, countries um, who actually signed the original UN um, agreement uh, were told that in 30 years time all the gold that they pledged as part of this Bretton Woods agreement to the IMF would be returned to them. Because obviously they knew in those days everybody was gold, gold mad, they were all gold bugs. Um, they knew without gold you had nothing. And so with the fractional reserve um, arrangement in, the, uh, in Bretton Woods, this guy, uh, Henry Dexter White as they're known to him, or Weissnowitz, he was very keen to ensure because they had a communist agenda from that point forward. Um, and it's also stated by, I think her name is Liz Bentley. Uh, she was a defecting courier, which was operating from the between the United States and Russia. She actually claimed in her memoirs uh, that Henry Dexter White or Henry Weissnowitz was primarily responsible for ensuring that the United States Treasury delivered to the Soviet Union the actual Treasury printing plates so that they could freely print United States currency as, as was their want. 
J. Edgar Hoover supposedly looked at it, um, Roosevelt looked at it, they tried to dismiss it as, but how come, you know, just those accusations alone should have barred him? But it was too late. The agreement had been signed, gold was supposed to be returned there for uh, 30 years on top of 44, uh, which had been 74. But just before that, don't forget, we have something coming up called a Nixon shock, where suddenly, unexpectedly, overnight, some guy like Richard Nixon just decides, oh, I think we must, uh, we must uh, disconnect the transferability or the exchange rate from the United States dollar to gold. Okay, so if you think these things happen by, by chance, uh, think again. So what these bankers had managed to do is take control of the United States, it took them 160 years only to do it. And what you've got to remember is the families, the banking families that were involved in this had massive expertise before they arrived in the United States for that first, um, that first charter to the Bank of the United States given in, was it 1791, I think by Alexander Hamilton or no, not sure. They were experts at doing what they did. These people were the, the Venetian, Genovese, uh, Florentine, double entry bookkeeping, banking families that had done this stuff so many times it, it, they didn't even have to think or prepare. So they would spy their prey, they go in and what they've got is money. And that's supposed to talk and that bribes. So they bribed who they needed to, they killed those that wouldn't conform, and it's very, very similar to how the, the deal operates today. If someone is not willing to play game, uh, the game they want, then they're bribed. If they won't accept the bribe, they're intimidated even more. And if that doesn't work, or they can't remove them any other way, they ensure that their mercenary CIA or um, uh, mafia, jacuzza, gangs move in and uh, have these people put out of the way. It's very easy to do and we see things like the suspicious death of Roosevelt. One of the reasons that I think he was killed is he was not a supporter of using the atomic bomb once the Manhattan Project had been revealed to him uh, and he'd seen the evidence of the tests of what happened. He wasn't very much for it. So, hmm, at a fairly young age, 1945, he dies. He doesn't see the war out. I think he was only 55 or 58. No age for a, a, a guy like the president to suddenly just mysteriously die. We had the same with, with this character, Henry Dexter White. When they started to look into him, uh, I think in 1949 at the age of 58, um, he dies in a car crash. Oh, hmm, well, never mind. So, what I'm trying to set the scene is, this isn't conspiracy theory. You need to look into this in great detail and start maybe trying to communicate some of this, not because you've watched Alex Jones or you've listened to Steve Bannon in the war room. Don't listen to any of the senators and, uh, and uh, the members of Congress, both sides of the aisle. Look at what comes through. This guy, Henry Dexter White, was a communist. Most of the people who were involved in putting these deals together through the history of the United States are, in effect, Democrats. So the blue on the tie is red. The red on the tie is blue. So if you look at what's being perpetrated here now by uh, AOC and the squad, and people like uh, Schumer, Schiff, Pelosi, Waters, uh, Feinstein, etc., on and on, and any member of the Democratic uh, caucuses, and the, uh, even the, G the other side, the Republican, and it's the same in your country, in Australia, or wherever you are in the world, these people are running on a socialist agenda. The socialist agenda entraps you because the individual in a socialist uh, communist society is not required. And what you have to have to pull, pull off this 
communist takeover. You have to have unscrup unscrupulous individuals who are um, narcissistic sociopaths because they've got to be prepared to push the agenda as hard as it needs pushing until the small coterie are left when the, the lemon has been squeezed till the pips just squeak. Until you get to that point, they've got to do whatever they can do to ensure that you don't have individuality, creativity, uh, and freedom of expression. It's not wanted on the voyage. So, people like Tucker Carlson out there, get wise to this. People like Tom Fitton, please wake up to the fact you don't have a constitution in the United States, you don't have a Department of Justice, you have no rule of law, and all of these companies are Con uh, organizations are working for a foreign entity which has got nothing to do with the, the, the soil or juice solly, the land of the United States. And I'm going to show you that as we come to the, the next part. So, the classic banking system which came out of World War I here, and if I haven't put it in World War II is that once the victory had been uh, assured, then the side, the ally side that was victorious, was always given the responsibility for the rebuild. On condition, and this is the condition, on condition, they gave the power and the right to handle the currency supply of the countries involved that were victorious. And that's why they lend to both sides. It doesn't matter who wins, they cannot lose. Because what they do is, when the, if, if any of these uh, so-called allies had reneged or refused with a gun against their head to, to sign, what they would have done is brought them on board very, very gently or very firmly by funding insurgency or guerrilla activity or some other accident that would befall the individual, put in the next ruler or, or governor, and then off we go. We're back on board, the jockey's back in the saddle, and we are making do with the plan, and it goes ahead. It can't fail. So that's what we've got. The war ends. There's a peace treaty. And so everyone is partying. So, as I've said before, it, it was very a, a, a situation that revolved around control and the United States in effect uh, and uh, all these other countries here being, being taken over. So as I'm going to get to the next part now, this is going to really be, I would think, what the actual bankruptcy meant for you. And this is probably your, your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. What did it actually mean? So I'm going to move now on to the next sheet. I'll keep that... I'll keep that safe until I want to come to it. Now, so, what the bankruptcy meant for you. Okay, so, now we have the dollar as the world currency. We have the dollar linked to all oil transactions. We have the dollar linked to all gold pricing. And so what we have then is in fact the United States dollar, which comes from the German word Fala, 
we have the world market now being flooded with dollars. Okay, so that was the perfect way to ensure that the so-called peace was won now because virtually everybody wanted United States dollars because they were seen as the, the great uh, victorious heroes who'd helped the world uh, to freedom. Um, the Federal Reserve was in place and now we have, we have a supposed world peace. So the IMF IMF and the World Bank Group were formed in 1944 at exactly the same time. All the signatories of Bretton Woods had offered up their gold supplies and what we end up now with was this IMF it's called the Paris Club of 22 and also the Club of Rome coordinating the so-called the so peace. So all of those countries that were involved in Bretton Woods in effect placed themselves into voluntary receivership. That was the deal. Many of them were actually bankrupt anyway, and the smaller countries in places like um, Indonesia or the Philippines or South America didn't have a pot to piss in anyway. Look at the state that the Japanese were in. Um, the Japanese had completely decimated and plundered um, mainland China and hoovered up, vacuumed up every morsel of gold that you could imagine um, with the 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 potential for them to find it, to store it, to make sure that they won the Second World War, came out victorious with, with, with not working with the Nazis, but as far as the bankers were concerned, the Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Axis powers took care of vacuuming all the wealth and the gold, taking it out of circulation uh, for, shall we say, Europe, and then uh, from the East or Far East, it was the job for the Japanese. So in effect, what we have is the World Bank states that there's only about 186,000 uh, metric ton of gold above the surface of the Earth. The true value uh, amount is probably four to five million metric tons. Uh, good news and bad news, uh, there's a lot more than people uh, are, are officially told. The bad news is if they reveal those facts, then probably the price of gold would go through the floor and it might be, might be arguably worthless. So, into voluntary receivership, the trustees of this bankruptcy, in effect, in 1944, but from 1933, in the main part for the USA, had made you a trustee, in effect, or a pledged security to pay off the debt. So the politicians and everyone who's involved in government in effect were working for the administration or for the receivership and this is why your courts in the United States or the United Kingdom are nothing more than an administrative court looking to bring in money. There's nothing to do with justice, there's nothing to do with a decent argument or an equity uh, right to fair treatment. It's purely for one thing only and that is for you as the guarantor of the GDP pledge which the politicians signed and allowed unbeknownst to you to happen and therefore I would suggest in a social contract being the highest form of contract what's called uberime fide of the utmost good faith they haven't revealed any of this to you and on that basis alone you have the right to vitiate the agreement. You were all welded into this through your social security number and your birth certificated bond that is, is held in, in a trust 
And as you weren't made aware of any of this, um, though they entered you in one by one as your mother um, signed the birth certificate or then you applied for the social security number when you got to the age of 16 or 18 so that you could go to work, once you'd volunteered yourself into that unwittingly, they brought you in one at a time, but I'm of the great belief that we can get out of it collectively with a more of a, a class action because it's too complicated for each individual to try and find his way out of this maze. So that's going to be something for the next video, which is going to be the solutions part. But for now, let's get into the, the nitty gritty. I think we're doing about, I've done about 45 minutes, <clears throat> no, 40 minutes so far. So we're coming up to the, the last part. Uh, so if you're thinking that I'm making all this up and it's a little bit, uh, well, you know, so what? And what can we do about it? Look at all the people that told you, you have to take control. The founding fathers said in their documents, we must be in control of the money supply. If we don't have control over that, we have nothing. Abraham Lincoln got assassinated because he wanted to take back control of the money supply. Um, John Kennedy got assassinated because he said that he wanted to take control of the money supply and get rid of the green back and start going back to what's called United States Treasury notes. Uh, a little bit late in the day, maybe, and he didn't understand exactly what had happened. But every time someone wanted to challenge the banking cartel, they ended up dead. Yeah. So this being this educational message out there, I don't know whether it's too much too late, but better for you to know it because who knows what entropy, what um, parallel actions can take place when information gets out and then you know that there's something that can be done but the one thing you've got to get through your minds or into your heads is you've been deceived and so if it's fraud if it's a lie if it's trickery if it's the snares and the traps and the work of the devil himself once you become aware of it we can do something about it but if you're not aware of it then we just carry on. So we've got to start standing up to these people like Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, the Rothschilds Bank, Barclays, and these large JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon concerns. Yeah, they are nothing other than thieves. And these are the people that have buried more people than the Catholic Church virtually. So it's something that I think you should get a little bit um, film network, uh, 1973 get as mad as hell because you're just not going to take it anymore. So what we have now, let's get to the, the point where I think this starts to come together. Now what we've got here is now the absolute benchmark proof and this is a fractional reserve note and it's got whatever it's got on it, and it's got the dollar signs on it, and it's got an amount on it. And what it's got here is a signature on these fractional reserve notes. These fractional reserve notes that pay everything. Now, it's a promissory note. I promise to pay the bearer whatever the denomination is on the note. And it's signed by someone who's official. Now, probably most of you out there watching now would think, ah, yes, but it's signed by the Secretary of the Treasury, isn't it? Well, it isn't. The current Secretary of the Treasury is uh, Janet Yellen. OK, but these signatories are done by what's called the Treasurer of the United States and the treasurer of the United States um, just so happens on the current bill to be a Native American lady. Now I think I should have written down what the names of these individuals are but I need to carry on, so I'm going to have to dispense with their names. So, what we've got is the treasurer. So, 
the idea here is that the treasurer on the note is the one that's backing or guaranteeing the note. And what we've got, therefore, is the current lady is a Native American lady and the previous seven are all Hispanic Mexican women. Since 1949, prior to 1949, every treasurer was a man. And since 1949, every single treasurer on these notes, 70% of them or 68% of them being uh, Mexican, Hispanic or Native American individuals, women. Now, why? Because it's something to do with the fact that if you're of Mexican birth, possibly, and I'm not 100% sure on this, so other people need to try and do some uh, research on this. Um, I think it's because of the difference between what's called jus sanguina and jus soli. That means that the, the right of citizenship due to birth on the land or that by the blood of the parents. So what I think is that the reason that they're using these women and they're using the uh, Mexican women, many of them as children were deported from the United States after 1931, 35, um, is because they are somehow either not naturalized or they're not officially citizens of the United States. So there's some type of trick or deception going on here. Now, so what we've got is we've got the, we've got something called the Organization of Monetary Affairs, and that's linked to the treasurer, treasurer of the United States. And then we've got the secretary, secretary of the treasury, which is nothing at all to do with the treasurer here. So this office of monetary affairs is a department within the Fed, the Federal Reserve. The secretary of the treasury, and I'll just check my notes on this, and this is in charge of the Treasury Department. The Treasurer signs all the banknotes. All government officers, therefore, so every office, so that's Senate, Congress, DOJ, FBI, CIA, um, TSA, FEMA, Department of Homeland Security,